So I talked to most of these folks back in 2020 when they were just candidates to be presidential electors. A lot of them at the time expressed uh, that the 2020 election for them was this sort of stark choice between saving the republic and democratic socialism. And they talked about the importance of serving as electors, said it was a very important role that they were taking very seriously. So it's been interesting to revisit those conversations three years later, now that they're facing criminal charges because of how they handled uh, that role or thought that they really were presidential electors. I'm Quinta Jurassic, a senior editor at Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, August 16th, 2023. On July 18th, Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel unveiled criminal charges against 16 people, the so-called fake electors from that state, who featured in Trump's effort to hold on to power in 2020. Just a few weeks later, a special counsel in Michigan announced additional charges related to the 2020 election, this time against three people who allegedly accessed voting machines in the state without authorization. So if you've been tracking developments when it comes to accountability for misconduct surrounding the 2020 election, it's best not to take your eye off Michigan. To discuss, I sat down with Clara Hendrickson, a politics reporter at the Detroit Free Press. We talked through the backstory behind these prosecutions and why Michigan became such a hotbed of conspiracy theories and alleged crimes in 2020. It's the Lawfare Podcast, August 16th, explaining the Michigan fake electors prosecution. We're going to talk about two different criminal cases in Michigan, uh, the prosecution of Michigan fake electors, and then a related story that has to do with separate criminal charges related to tampering of voting machines. So let's start with the first. What are the charges that were unveiled against the Michigan fake electors? Sure. So last month, Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel announced criminal charges against a group of 16 Michigan Republicans who allegedly participated in an effort to overturn the 2020 election by signing a phony certificate pledging Michigan's electoral college votes to Trump, even though he lost in the state. So they face multiple felony charges, including conspiracy to commit forgery and conspiracy to commit election law forgery. In all, they face up to 85 years behind bars. And this is an older group. Uh, so for some of them, that could mean that if, if convicted with all of these charges, they could be potentially spending the rest of their lives in, in prison. So talk to me a little bit about what exactly this scheme is that they've been charged over. I think that listeners might be at this point familiar with kind of the broad strokes of the fake electors scheme, that it was an effort by the Trump campaign to sort of create uh, at first sort of contingently slates of electors to uh, retain the possibility that Trump could win and that it then moved closer to sort of outright fraud. What happened in Michigan? How did this play out? Sure. So, well, I guess my first my first experience with this whole situation of alternate electors, it goes all the way back to December 14, 2020. We had a colleague who was at the Michigan Capitol the day that Michigan's actual presidential electors met and cast the state's electoral college votes for Joe Biden. And a really interesting thing happened outside of the Capitol building that day. There was a group of Republicans who were nominated by the Republican Party here to cast Michigan's electoral college votes in the event that Trump won. He didn't, but they showed up anyways and tried to get into the Capitol building that day. They were denied entry. And then, you know, at the start of 2022, we learned that Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel, her office had been considering bringing charges against that group of people because they apparently sent 
a certificate claiming that they were the duly elected presidential electors for Michigan. They weren't, and that they had met in the Capitol to cast the state's electoral college votes. They didn't. They sent that to the National Archives in an effort, we know now, that uh, may have tried to thwart the will of voters in 2020. And so that is at issue right now in this criminal case. It's the first case that we're seeing nationally, even though there were multiple states where these alternate slates of electors convened. It's the first case in in Michigan where criminal charges are being brought against the group of folks whose names actually appear on that certificate. And so how do we get to the point where the state attorney general is charging these individuals sort of in parallel with the federal investigation? As you mentioned, there's been a lot of discussion around fake, about fake electors around the country. There's been a lot of focus recently on the Fulton County investigation in Georgia. But uh, maybe this is just my East Coast chauvinism. I feel like the Michigan case was kind of a sleeper. It, it kind of came out of nowhere when Nessel announced it. Yeah, not not your East Coast chauvinism. It definitely sort of surprised some folks here in Michigan who have been covering this because at the start of 2022, Nestle announced that her office had been considering bringing charges for a year, but ultimately decided to refer the matter to the feds because she thought the feds at the time were better suited to take on an investigation that it appeared to span multiple states in a kind of coordinated effort to overturn the 2020 election. And so it wasn't something that we were necessarily anticipating. I guess at the time she didn't rule out potentially bringing criminal charges, but after inaction from the federal authorities, she said on the two year anniversary of January 6th, the start of this year, that her office had reopened its criminal probe into this group of Michigan Republicans whose names d- appeared on this phony certificate. And now, you know, last month she, she announced that she was, she was going to charge this group. So let's talk about the specific people who have been charged. You spoke with some of them before the election when you did a project interviewing the various electors, both on the Democratic and Republican side. Who are they? What did they tell you? Are there any sort of shared characteristics that jumped out at you about this group? Yeah, so it, it's it's a you know sizable group and it sort of spans the spectrum from folks who have held leadership positions within the Republican Party, folks who are a little bit more involved at the local level, whether it's county Republican politics or congressional district level politics. But I kind of put them into three separate categories. So you have the folks who've held prominent leadership positions, former Michigan GOP co-chair Michonne Maddock. Her husband is a state lawmaker here in Michigan and the Republican National Committee woman for Michigan, Kathy Burden. And then you have a group of local officials. There's a local township clerk who's actually in charge of running elections in his community. The Michigan elections director recently said that because of the criminal indictment, he's going to be barred from carrying out those duties. And there's a school board member near the Flint area uh, and a, a mayor of a city on the west side of the state. And then the rest of them kind of fall into the bucket of enthusiastic Trump voters who kind of got involved in Republican politics a little bit more recently, including a group of people who participated in, there was that Sidney Powell lawsuit to overturn the 2020 election in Michigan. Some of them were plaintiffs in that case. So I talked to most of these folks back in 2020 when they were just candidates to be presidential electors. A lot of them at the time expressed uh, that the 2020 election for them was this sort of stark choice between saving the republic and democratic socialism. And they talked about the importance of serving as electors, said it was a very important role that they were taking very seriously. So it's been interesting to revisit those conversations three years later, now that they're facing criminal charges because of how they handled uh, that role or thought that they really were presidential electors. 
And do we have any indication either from the arraignments, from the charging documents themselves in Michigan, or the many reports that have come out about how these folks are thinking about their role in what the uh, special counsel's office has asserted as a conspiracy? Are they, you know, has anyone had their road to Damascus moment? Or are people still sort of believing that they really did the right thing? Well, a lot of them will say, well, we, I guess I'll, I'll put it this way. We, there's sort of two, two reactions and defenses that we've heard so far. One is that we were tricked or deceived into signing something and we weren't fully informed of what the document said. There's Michelle Lundgren, who's one of the uh, folks charged here. And she said she thought she was just signing her name to a sign-in sheet when she went to that meeting where they said that you know, they signed the document saying they were duly sworn electors. And then you have Michonne Maddock, who has publicly said that this was all just a, a thing to have just in case some of the legal challenges from Trump allies succeeded and a court decided that Trump actually won Michigan. We wanted to make sure that we had the documents in place to ensure that our electoral college votes would actually count. So those are the two main defenses we've heard so far. And all of the fake electors have so far pleaded not guilty. Is that correct? Correct. So one of the things that I found interesting about this was that, as you say, I feel like during the January 6th committee's investigation, during the hearings, there is a general sense that, yeah, some some of these people who signed on as fake electors were really like all in for sort of as far as this would go, and others were perhaps kind of roped into this under what they claimed were false pretenses. Were you surprised to see that all 16 of the fake electors were charged? Um, because from what you say, it sounds like some of them might be trying to or might be able to offer kind of better defenses about having been tricked rather than having intentionally gone along with this plan. Yeah, I guess I wasn't surprised to see all 16 of them charged. All of their names appear on the document. And I think for Nessel, her argument is that they all knew what they were doing. They were allegedly engaged in a, a conspiracy, knowingly signing a f- phony document with the intent to defraud. But I'm sure as these cases proceed, we'll hear different things about what people knew and when and how closely some of these folks may have been coordinating with the Trump campaign, which some of them have publicly said helped coordinate and lead this effort. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit. What do we know about the role of the Trump campaign in helping move this forward? Yeah, so we have the testimonies from Laura Cox, who's the former Michigan GOP chair and then RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel. They they testified before the January 6th committee and Cox told the committee that she spoke with a a Trump ally who proposed originally having the Republican electors sleep overnight in the Capitol because Michigan law requires the electors to convene on the Senate floor to cast the state's electoral college votes. She said that that was a a ridiculous idea and inappropriate and that slumber party situation never (laughs) never actually (laughs) manifested. And and to be clear is they would need to sleep overnight because the Capitol during the day, there would be people doing things that they were supposed to be doing. And so they would need to kind of stick around after the fact to pull this off. Well, there there were restrictions about who could enter the Capitol building that day. So uh, only the officials sort of presiding over the Electoral College vote and the presidential electors themselves were admitted into the Capitol, which is why when the Republicans showed up saying, we're the electors, let us in, the Michigan State Police Lieutenant said, you can't come in here. We're not letting anyone else here. And the electors have already shown up. And Michigan law uh, requires them to be in the Senate chamber at, at 2 p.m. I think in a, I was just revisiting one of the memos saying that it would be a bit awkward in Michigan to potentially carry out an effort to seat an alternative slate of electors <laughs> because of that requirement. So I think that was the impetus for the, the sleepover idea. 
So I cut you off. You were talking about how uh, McDaniel and, and Cox were discussing sleepovers. Yeah. yeah. And then Mc- McDaniel told the January 6th committee that John Eastman, who was a lawyer advising Trump and others in an effort to overturn the election, talked to her about the RNC helping with the effort to see alternative electors and uh, reaching out to them and assembling them. And she said that the Trump campaign took the lead and that the RNC was just helping them in that role. Right. So that seems to kind of sketch out a story where this is not like a bunch of self-starters in Michigan sort of decide to do this just on their own. It's very much according to the testimony and the documentation we have from the January 6th committee and the the uh, alleged actions as described in the Michigan charging documents. This is really something that is coordinated with the Trump campaign as part of Trump's ongoing efforts to stay in power. Yeah, and I should note that one of the documents filed by the Attorney General's office in support of the criminal charges said that Cox and the RNC helped organize the meeting at the Michigan GOP headquarters in Lansing, where the fake electors allegedly convened in the basement. And there, uh, according to the Attorney General's office, a Trump campaign aide, Sean Flynn, spoke to the group. So I imagine we'll be hearing a lot more about those details and what was said um, as these cases proceed. So how has the Michigan Republican Party responded to these allegations? Because what you're describing, as you say, there's one group of people who are sort of enthusiastic Trump voters who began participating in politics relatively recently, but also you're describing a situation where the sort of institutional Michigan GOP is really closely involved with something that the attorney general has now alleged to be a crime. Has the Republican Party said anything? Have they tried to distance themselves from this? No, they have not, because they have accused Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel instead of exhibiting authoritarian tendencies and and weaponizing her office to go after this group. It was shortly after Nessel announced the charges that the Michigan GOP put out a statement saying that they're going to be closely monitoring these cases uh, and vowed to, quote, recruit and deploy activists as needed. And that it was it was really fascinating to see them put out that statement because it kind of stood in stark contrast to the statement put out by one of the Republican legislative leaders here in Michigan. You all might remember um, Matt Hall. He was the Republican who invited Rudy Giuliani to testify before the State House Oversight Committee in 2020, where Giuliani encouraged lawmakers to uh, insert themselves in the, in the election on behalf of Trump. And that that whole hearing was sort of parodied on, on SNL. But Matt Hall put out a different statement that said that the charges Nestle brought are really serious and that she bears the burden of showing that they're not politically motivated. So you have uh, authoritarian tendencies coming from the Michigan GOP and uh, burden of proof here is on Nestle to ensure that she's not, you know, misusing her powers from from the legislative leader. That's really interesting. Are there is is that kind of divide present? Has that been el- present elsewhere um, in kind of the reaction to the fallout from January 6th and efforts to overturn the 2020 election between the the party and Republican legislators? Or is this a new division? Well, of course, there were a lot of GOP legislators in 2020 who were supportive of efforts to investigate claims of fraud and wrongdoing. There are some folks who have embraced claims that the election was stolen. But increasingly, we're starting to see this divide between the official party apparatus and their sort of full embrace of election denialism and Republicans who are in office and are in the minority and want to flip control of the chamber, who've sort of said that we're not going to keep focusing on the 2020 election. That's proven to be a loser for us here in Michigan. 
So that that gets to the fact that Michigan is, uh, I think it's fair to say, tell me if I'm wrong, a purple state. It was a, a swing state, obviously, in the 2020 election, which is part of why it featured so prominently. Can you kind of walk me through like why it is that Michigan became so important? Obviously, again, no shade to the great state of Michigan, <laughs> but why why Michigan as opposed to, say, Pennsylvania? It became such a linchpin for so many of these conspiracy theories, which I do want to talk about, um, and other legal efforts to overturn the election. Yeah. Well, I feel like Michigan sometimes gets called a purple state, lean Democrat, lean Republican, swing state. The New Yorker just declared Michigan a Democratic stronghold. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> but obviously, Michigan has played a really central role in the last two presidential elections. In 2016, Trump won Michigan by a really small margin, just over 10,000 votes, uh, which is why Michigan was kind of front and center again in, in 2020 and a big target of Trump's false uh, stolen election claims. So it's, it's a very closely contested state. I think in 2024, we'll see whether or not that 2016 presidential victory for Trump was kind of a fluke, or if it's something that he might be able to repeat again under favorable circumstances. Part of the the way that Michigan became so central in the narratives around 2020 had to do with a series of conspiracy theories, I think it's fair to say, mm -hmm. that kind of really took hold among right-wing media and kind of I feel like created this idea that Michigan was a, a hotbed of election fraud. So tell me a little bit about those theories. Like what, what is it? I mean, you're, you're here in, in Michigan reporting on this at the time. What was it like for you seeing all of these theories kind of come up and having to report them out and bat them down? Yeah, it was constant. It was like playing whack-a-mole and it was tough because it was kind of a constant race against time watching social media and Trump's tweets and just the numbers of likes and retweets going up exponentially while I was in the middle of fact checking some of the claims he was making. So it was just, it was really tough in the moment, but in retrospect, it's been really helpful to kind of have a, a record of how these claims got picked up and having really sort of clear debunking of them. They're one of the, the biggest claims um, that kind of got elevated by, by Trump and his allies, there was a human error in Antrim County. It's a small, small county in northern Michigan. There, there wasn't an update that was performed. And so basically what happened was when the results were uploaded, the vote totals weren't matched to the right races. And so the results kind of got jumbled. There was nothing wrong with the machine and the machine's ability to tabulate the ballot, but it was an example of an error that could be easily corrected and identified shortly after the problem occurred. But that window created an opening for disinformation to spread. And Matt DiPerno, um, who's actually facing criminal charges in a, in a separate uh, matter to undermine the results of 2020 election, he was the lawyer behind a lawsuit targeting Antrim County and what happened there. And that really became a, a vehicle to spread all kinds of conspiracies about voting machines. Yeah, so I definitely want to talk about the criminal charges against Perno, but let's also to sort of continue painting the picture, talk about some of the civil litigation that was taking place around the election. So you mentioned there's the DePerno litigation. Um, there's also, as you mentioned, the the famous Kraken case um, filed by Sidney Powell and her team of lawyers, some of whom were from Michigan, others came in like Powell from outside. Just tell, tell me a little bit about those cases. You know, how many were there? Um, what were the arguments? How did they do in court? Oh, gosh, I, I've lost track. There were, so, <laughs> there were so many. It was just one of those situations where I think it really made me appreciate that there's 
it, it now seems that there's the election day and the actual voting that takes place. And then there's the battle in courts now. Like elections have become very litigious affairs. Uh, and we we were all pretty exhausted, just sort of divvying up coverage responsibility for the various lawsuits. But another one that I'll add to the list, it was uh, one that was filed in, in Wayne County, um, where Detroit is located, targeting the absentee ballot counting in Detroit, saying that there were all kinds of problems with, you know, ballot duplication and Republican monitors who were observing the count claims that a bunch of Biden ballots that weren't valid were brought into the the middle of the night to be counted. So all of that was debunked. And then we saw those same claims later show up in the, the Sidney Powell Kraken lawsuit. None of these cases succeeded. And in fact, some of the attorneys involved have been sanctioned for their participation in these legal efforts to to try and either delay the certification of the vote or overturn the election altogether. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about the sanctions, because I think that's an interesting thread of the story, too. Yeah. So those stem from the Sidney Powell lawsuit. There were nine lawyers involved in that lawsuit. And the federal judge who heard that case imposed sanctions on all nine of them, ordering them to pay legal fees for the state of Michigan and the city of Detroit, and then participate in continuing legal education. And they were all referred to the um, the attorney discipline boards in, in their jurisdictions. We just had a ruling from the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals upholding sanctions for all but two of them. So those payments are going to be due soon, but that's sort of the status now. And, and just this week, the, the court dismissed um, a petition to have the entire bench rehear the case. So that's where the, the sanctions stand. Yeah, so the, the fallout from this, even separate from the criminal cases, is very much still ongoing, it sounds like. Yeah, but it also makes me wonder how much uh, money some of these attorneys receive for representing clients in these cases and how big of a financial hit the sanctions will end up being. All right. So let's talk about the charges against DePerno and two other folks, one of whom I believe uh, was actually a lawyer on the Kraken case. What are the charges here? Like, what is the story and who are the folks who have been charged? Yeah. So in the wake of the 2020 election, we started to hear about reports that third parties got access to voting machines across the state of Michigan. Uh, and the Secretary of State's office referred those reports to the Attorney General's office. And ahead of the 2020 election, the Attorney General's office said that in the course of this investigation, we found out that uh, the political opponent running against Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel was involved in an alleged plot to gain unauthorized access to voting machines. So her office referred the matter to a special prosecutor, asked for a special prosecutor to consider bringing charges. And the result of that is now we have grand jury charges against Matt DiPerno, former Michigan GOP state representative Dare Rendon, and Michigan lawyer Stephanie Lambert, who, as you mentioned, was involved in that Sidney Powell lawsuit. And so what is it exactly that they're supposed to have done here? Because my my understanding is that this has to do with a really long running effort that included a successful effort by DiPerno to actually get a court order to let him look at voting machine information. What did he do that was beyond that such that it opened him up to potential criminal liability, according to the special prosecutor? Yeah, so... According to the special prosecutor, this group of three folks, DiPerno, Rendon, and Lambert, they seized voting machines across Michigan. And Michigan law, according to the special prosecutor's office, uh, prohibits what's called the undue possession of voting machine. And this is actually really fascinating because before any charges were brought against these individuals, the special prosecutor in this case, who's based in Muskegon County, DJ Hilson, 
he asked the court to issue a declaratory ruling interpreting Michigan election law about who can access machines and when. And the court ruled that Michigan law prohibits the undue possession, including if that possession is not authorized by the Secretary of State or a court order. So that's what would distinguish access to voting machines here, because in the case of Antrim County, DiPerno did get a court order get granting access to the machines. And allegedly, that was not the case here, that, or there, there were no court orders giving access to machines. And so the the criminal case hinges upon these folks gaining access to machines that they weren't supposed to. And what is it that they were trying to do with with these machines? Because this is part of a broader effort, right? Like it's, we've seen uh, there's some discussion about access to voting information that may have been improper in Georgia's Coffee County. I believe there are other counties around the country. Um, so this is, you know, this is an effort that's not just happening in Michigan. What were these folks trying to accomplish by digging into these machines? Yeah, so according to um, Nestle's investigation of these reports of third-party access to voting machines, the tabulators were brought back to Oakland County, where a team of uh, folks broke into them and tampered with them and performed various tests on them. Uh, we've seen some of the affidavits filed in support of that DiPerno Antrim County lawsuit talk about tests that were performed on the machine. There was a, a video that was posted, I believe, on OAN with uh, footage of one of the folks accused of performing tests on the machine, sort of doing that with the equipment, running the ballots to argue that here's how the machine can be manipulated to count votes cor- incorrectly. So you mentioned that DiPerno was a political candidate actually running against Nessal. Is there anything else that we should know about him um, in terms of, you know, where he stands with the Republican Party, what kind of approach to Trump versus anti-Trump he took? And what about the other folks who are uh, who have been charged as well? Hmm. Yeah, so DiPerno was endorsed by Trump in 2020 um, when he was running for attorney general and and he's probably one of the most prominent Trump allies in Michigan who spread disinformation about voting machines in the 2020 election. And in 2020, he was campaigning alongside Christina Caramo, who was the other Trump endorsed candidate. She was running for Secretary of State to be Michigan's chief elections officer, another individual who um, promoted false claims about the 2020 election. And actually, at the the beginning of the year, the two of them ran against each other in the race to be the chair of the Michigan GOP. Karamo ultimately won out. But it was sort of an interesting instance where we're seeing that the fight within the at least the official apparatus of the Michigan GOP isn't necessarily Trump or anti-Trump. That's sort of happening broadly among Republicans in Michigan. But there's this conflict uh, within the party, I guess, between different personalities. So that that's sort of where things stand now. And he's actually facing a disciplinary action before the attorney discipline board in a, in a separate matter. So it was sort of facing an, a number of, of challenges to, you know, on the criminal side and then even potentially looking at losing his law license. And who are the other two people who have been charged alongside him? What's their background? Yeah, so former Michigan GOP state representative Dare Rundin, another Trump ally who promoted false claims of a stolen election when she was in office. She's no longer um, a state legislator. She was term limited and she's no longer in office. Um, And then there's Stephanie Lambert, and she's an attorney in Michigan that's been really involved in various efforts to undermine the 2020 election. She was involved in that Sidney Powell lawsuit. Um, She toured the state of Michigan, encouraging counties to launch forensic audits of the 2020 election. Those were not successful, but she's, she's sort of continued to question the 2020 election and has gone on uh, most recently to to argue that the criminal charges that she's facing are an effort to sort of thwart Trump leading into the next presidential election. 
So you mentioned that the uh, special prosecutor in this case took the sort of unusual step of going to a court to kind of get like pre-cleared essentially for his interpretation of election law, which I think is interesting insofar as it speaks to caution um, and perhaps uh, acknowledgement that what he's doing here is going to be politically scrutinized pretty closely. Both in this case and in the case brought by Nessel, I'm curious if you've seen any other indications of how these two prosecutors are planning to kind of navigate uh, the political scrutiny that they get um, and the fact that, you know, whatever they do, a lot of people are going to accuse them of, uh, like you said, you know, being authoritarians, um, going after people for political reasons. Yeah. So one other thing to note in the special prosecutor's investigation of the voting machine seizures is that he also convened a grand jury to consider bringing criminal charges. And that's pretty rare in Michigan. So rather than bringing the criminal charges himself, he petitioned to convene a grand jury, which actually brought the charges. It's a group of citizens who get advice from the special prosecutor and so the special prosecutor in that case didn't bring it. And he sort of emphasized when the charges were announced that this was done by an independent group of citizens. That is another part of the process that's sort of come under fire by Stephanie Lambert. But I think it's an interesting note of just how uh, unusual the handling of the investigation has been in, in that case. Nestle, meanwhile, uh, obviously brought her office, brought the charges and she sort of acknowledged publicly that she's going to be accused of political interference. That's just sort of where politics stand right now. Um, But she said it would have been malfeasance for her to not act in the face of what she called overwhelming evidence of guilt. So I mentioned that this, this effort was kind of going on in parallel with a number of other efforts to uh, quote unquote audit Uh, state election equipment. And in Arizona, people may have heard of the involvement of this company that's called uh, somewhat amusingly Cyber Ninjas, uh, that was engaged in a ballot audit in Maricopa County in 2021, looking at the 2020 election. That was pretty conclusively debunked and has led to a lot of different legal trouble, uh, because it (laughs) turns out that their conclusions were maybe not so reliable when they said that they were looking into fraud. Um, And the Cyber Ninjas actually show up here in Michigan. Michigan as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So when Nestle, her office initially released the results of its investigation into the voting machine uh, seizures, she identified Doug Logan, who's the CEO of the now shuttered cybersecurity firm Cyber Ninjas that was in charge of carrying out the, the ballot review in Maricopa County as one of the computer experts who was involved with testing the machines. The special prosecutor announced that the charges weren't brought against Logan and the other computer experts accused of tampering with the machines uh, because according to the special prosecutor's review, they weren't sort of fully informed of whether or not they actually had legal access to be um, handling the machines. But it was interesting to review some, some text messages that came across my radar earlier this week we have uh, a paper in Arizona. Gannett has a paper in Arizona, uh, Arizona Republic, and they've been filing a public records lawsuit to get access to records related to the Arizona audit. And that uncovered a trove of text messages between Logan and Stephanie Lambert, who's charged in the voting machine probe. And reading the, some of them was just, it was really interesting and sort of shed light on the coordination and even concerns that some of them had with with handling the machines. So in one of them, Lambert texts Logan and she says, we have access to new machines here. And she goes on to write, keep that a secret. And then in a separate exchange, Logan reaches out to Lambert and says that it was his opinion in Michigan that the equipment was 
put under Lambert's care and that even if he did handle it, it wasn't under his control. And then he basically asks for her input on whether or not that was the right way to sort of frame it. So just sort of like interesting breadcrumbs here about how some of these actors were connecting in the course of of this whole you know situation to review voting machines. And so just to be clear, so that, that suggests that Lambert may have actually had a, a pretty central role in this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what are you expecting as these prosecutions move forward? Are we expecting any additional charges, any other investigations that we know of that are going on? So not expecting additional charges in the voting machine probe because the special prosecutor said that these are all the charges that are going to be brought here. He said that explicitly. And there could be some more charges in the fake electors case because Nessel, when she announced those charges, said that the investigation is still ongoing and didn't rule out bringing charges against potential future defendants. And are there any other aspects of sort of post 2020 shenanigans in Michigan that jump out at you as things that prosecutors might potentially want to look into or are the the fake electors and the uh, election machine tampering sort of the main two things? I think those are the main two things. You know, th- three years later, I think we've turned over a lot of stones about how various actors uh may have tried to meddle in the 2020 election. So I would be surprised to see any other sort of new cases that emerge. I think we're going to see a little bit more of just like pulling on threads of what we already know happened. So I want to close by asking you about something that you wrote recently for the Detroit Free Press, where you you said, uh, there's a presidential election next year, but I never stopped covering the last one. And I just wanted to kind of ask, you know, what has this been like for you that this has been a sort of assignment that never stopped, basically? Um, is, is there a bit of a Groundhog Day feeling to it? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of it. I mean, it's uh, in some ways, it's been really helpful to have covered. I started the Detroit Free Press in June 2020 and just being able to draw on work that I did from that time now having interviewed a lot of the Republicans who are now facing criminal charges in the fake electors case, it's just been really helpful to sort of have that knowledge and those contexts that have been established. But, uh, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say sometimes it's a little bit exhausting to cover what feels like uh, an interminable election, but also nice every once in a while when I get to turn my attention to to other things and covering the state legislature or Michigan's redistricting process. But uh, 2020 is always sort of humming in the background. Let's leave it there. Clara, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Materials supporter through our website, lawfaremedia.org support. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. This podcast is edited by Jen Pacha Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening.